In the heart of South America, deep in the remaining mists and shadows of a lost world, a shaman in a drug-induced trance communicates with the spirit of a creature from our worst nightmares. The shaman sees visions and dreams dreams, and he prays for protection for his people as they journey through the forest. The jungle around him teems with potentially deadly animals. But the Piaroa Indians revere one above all others. It's the largest and one of the most venomous spiders in the world, the giant tarantula. The Indian's respect is understandable. Everything about this spider is formidable. It has eight eyes, fangs an inch long, and legs which can comfortably span a dinner plate. It hunts on the ground, mostly at night. During the day, it holds up beneath the forest floor, often taking over abandoned rodent burrows. The giant tarantula isn't the only fearsome creature to inhabit these parts one of the most deadly snakes in South America. Its poison causes paralysis, swiftly followed by the breakdown of the living tissue. Its immobilized victims suffer an agonizing death, slowly dissolving from the inside out. The local remedy for the snake's bite is to amputate the affected limb immediately. Although the fer de lance will attack humans in self-defense, it usually preys on rodents, occasionally cornering them underground. It's obviously looking for food, but there's no mere mouse down this burrow. The giant tarantula has the largest venom glands of any spider. There are no authenticated reports of anyone being bitten by one. Perhaps no one has lived to tell the tale so no one knows just how poisonous it is. Even so, the odds of winning a fight with a fer de lance seem stacked against the spider. In just four minutes, the snake twitches its tail for the last time. Giant tarantulas produce copious amounts of venom, curiously similar in effect to that of the snake. As its victim slowly disintegrates, the spider sucks up the nutritious fluids through small mouth parts hidden beneath its fangs. Even the snake's backbone, already stripped of flesh, will eventually be partially digested and devoured. A 
once deadly fang dangles limp and impotent. After 17 hours, all that remains of a formerly lethal snake is its shriveled skin. With a creature like this lurking unseen in the forest, it's not surprising the Piaroa Indians seek spiritual guidance. A wax replica of a tarantula adorns the ceremonial headdress of a village shaman. While under the influence of Yapo, a hallucinatory drug, he communicates with the spider spirits, asking for their protection. The drug is made by grinding the seeds of a local tree. The active chemicals are absorbed through the nose. Soon, the shaman will see visions. The shaman's lucky rock keeps his body anchored to this world, while his mind journeys through the spiritual universe. The Piaroa live in the central region of Venezuela. This land of mists and lonely peaks inspired Conan Doyle to write The Lost World, his epic adventure story of savage tribes and prehistoric beasts. No dinosaurs survive, but the Amazon jungle is home to many spine-chilling, real-life animals. They're creatures the Piaroa could encounter any day of their lives. Very few of the spectacular sandstone mountains have been explored, so who knows what lurks on their isolated plateaus. The largest in the region rises over 3,000 feet. It is sacred to the Piaroa, and it features in many of their legends. They call it Wahari Kuwai. Thousands of years ago, a great tree laden with all the fruits of the forest grew here. The gods sent a boy to cut down the tree so that it would provide food for all men and beasts living in its shadow. When a greedy tapir ate more than its fair share, the gods turned both the tree and the beast to stone as a lesson to everyone. The Piaroa heed the messages from the gods. They believe that if they take only what they need, Wahari Kuai will not only provide for another day, but also keep them safe. They say that the trumpeter bird was sent by the gods as a reward for taking care of the forest. These chicken-sized birds have taken to living round Indian settlements. In return for a few scraps, they helped to rid the village of pests, especially snakes, even the fer de lance. <laughs> The snakes have few enemies, but the trumpeter bird kills small ones. If the snake is too big to tackle, the bird's alarm calls alert the villagers to the danger. The snake's cryptic coloring confused the bird, and camouflage probably saved the spider. 
Even giant tarantulas are vulnerable to attack. Trumpeter birds have little impact on the spider and snake populations. They may help control their numbers around the village, but the forest still teems with them. Before the men go hunting, they ask the shaman to pray for their protection from the many dangerous wild beasts living out in the forest. The shaman's ceremonial headdress helps him to reach the god of the animal it represents. The drugs have not yet worn off. He is still able to communicate with the spirits. The Piaroa hunt with blowpipes and poison darts. The forest supplies all the materials they need to make their weapons. A local wood is used to make the blowpipe and the shafts of the darts. The flights of the darts are fashioned out of wild cotton, and then the points are tipped with curare, a deadly poison. Curare is made from the bark of a local vine. Once the sap has been extracted, it's gently warmed until it's thick and sticky. The replica giant tarantula also originates in the jungle. It's molded out of a less dangerous substance, wild beeswax. The Piaroa regard the forest as their friend, but they know that all relationships require mutual respect. They cannot take without giving in return. The men may be away for three days, but they take only their weapons. The forest will provide for all their other needs. Although they are well armed, the hunters value the shaman's company to pacify the forest gods and bring them good fortune. Out of his trance, he's a skilled hunter too. The Piaroa hunt a wide variety of animals, including birds, deer, rodents, and monkeys. They are expert trackers who can move silently through the forest, stealthily creeping up on their prey and taking it by surprise. Of all the animals, they regard one, a very dangerous one, as a particular delicacy. But at first they hunt less risky prey to supply the communal cooking pots. Using a blowpipe 10 feet long requires a steady hand. The Indians are dead shots from up to 50 yards.
the Pieroa are masterly climbers. A darted bird caught in the canopy is rarely lost. Curare is so potent that it kills almost instantly, causing a massive heart attack. The poison breaks down when it is boiled, so the birds can safely be eaten after cooking. The hunters waste very little, extracting the undamaged arrows. Hunting requires courage as well as skill. Venomous animals lurk unseen throughout the forest, and every year some Indians die from bites and stings. But no one has ever been killed by a giant tarantula, yet. The Piaroa believe their faith keeps them safe, and that the spirits have shown the spiders how to stay out of their way. Each spider spins several strands of silk, radiating out from the entrance of its burrow specifically to detect the approach of both enemies and prey. The trap set, the spider retreats underground to lie in wait for unsuspecting victims but even venomous spiders have their enemies. Like many creatures in this lost world, the tarantula hawk wasp has grown to giant proportions. It's evolved into a winged demon the size of a human palm. The wasp hunts giant tarantulas, not to eat, but as a host for its eggs. First, it must lure the spider out of its lair it walks over the invisible silk fan on the spider's doorstep, pulling as many strings as possible, deliberately setting off the trap. It then attempts to sting and paralyze the spider, attacking its soft underbelly. If the spider is immobilized, the wasp will lay her eggs in her victim and entomb it in its own burrow. Here the tarantula will gradually be eaten alive by the wasp's larvae developing inside it. The wasp badly misjudges its attack, allowing the spider to strike first. It retreats, mortally wounded. The rains start in April. For the next five months, the area will be deluged several times a day. Once dry creeks turn into torrents. When they burst their banks, they flood the forest. Giant tarantulas live on the higher slopes above the flood level. They like dry burrows but a damp climate and are most active during the wet season. The Piaroa are well aware that the spiders come out after a storm and they know exactly where to find them. The hunters hide their catch out of the reach of scavengers, like foxes or wild cats, for collection later. The chances of stepping on a spider are higher during the rainy season than at any other time of year. Since the spiders emerge mainly after dark, the hunters set up camp just before nightfall. They have journeyed far into the jungle, but their search is not over yet. Giant tarantulas may live above the flood levels, but several of their tree-living relatives live in the flooded forest. They often hide under orchids.
few biologists have ventured this far into the Amazon jungle, so many of the tarantulas which live here are unknown to science. This species has yet to be classified and named. The orchid's tangled root system provides a bird-eating spider with an ideal daytime retreat. Bird-eating spiders are a kind of tarantula. Despite their name, they hunt insects at night and rarely catch feathered prey. They are venomous and have a nasty bite, but it's no worse than a hornet sting. The giant tarantula can kill animals many times its own size, but it too feeds mainly on insects. The movements of a potential victim travel as a vibration along the silk threads leading to the burrow. The sensitive hairs on the spider's legs can detect the slightest quiver. Tarantulas sometimes go on the prowl, but generally they wait near their burrow entrance for potential victims to come within pouncing distance. To avoid attracting the attention of potential enemies, the giant tarantula takes its prey down its burrow. There are few animals which will risk following this spider three feet underground. It covers the floor of its lair with a silk mat. This helps to keep it clean and stops ants, which can carry disease, from invading the chamber. It also forms the base of a silk cocoon, which will eventually encase its victim like a mummy. The spider spins several strands at the same time, which it drapes over the locust, attaching the loose ends to the floor. As the spider injects more venom, the internal tissues rapidly break down. The tight silk shroud stops the insect's body from falling apart as it is sucked dry. Giant tarantulas keep themselves and their lair meticulously clean to prevent contamination by fungi and bacteria and to deter scavenging ants. The shriveled pellet, the remains of the locust, will be removed before daybreak. For now, the giant tarantula leaves its lair to search for prey under the cover of darkness. It's safe to hunt all night. Its greatest enemy is only active during the day.
The Amazon jungle is home to the world's biggest snake, as well as the largest venomous spider. Both species are giants, larger-than-life monsters from the real lost world. The anaconda, which can grow to a length of over 30 feet, hunts in rivers and relies on the water's buoyancy to support its weight. The spider produces so much venom, it needs to drink regularly. The Piaroa fear the anaconda as much as the giant tarantula. During the rainy season, much of the forest is flooded, forcing the Indians to join the snake in its element. The men watch their step. The anaconda will not attack unless provoked. Although it is non-venomous, it has a painful bite, and deep puncture wounds can get infected with fatal consequences. The forest provides many natural remedies, but the Piaroa have no antibiotics. The anaconda is a fitting denizen of this lost world, the Hoatzin another. Like a relic from the past, it shares a primitive feature with prehistoric birds. Young Hoatzins first leave their nest at about a week old, long before they can fly. Most chicks would crash to the ground and fall victim to predators, but the Hoatzin hatches with rudimentary claws on its wings. The chicks use the claws to clamber about the branches. Wing claws are also found in Archaeopteryx, an ancestral bird and an unpleasant character encountered by the adventurers to the fictitious lost world. There's nothing menacing about the Hoatzin. It's strictly vegetarian, feeding on fruit, flowers, and leaves. Here in the Amazon forest, the bird is surrounded by a vast abundance of food. The Hoatzin is superbly adapted to life in the flooded forest. The chick can swim from a few days old, and with those wing claws, it is quite capable of clambering back up into its nest. For years, the birds have been classified among the primitive species. Now it is suggested that their wing claws are a recent adaptation. To scientists, the Hoatzin is an unsolved mystery, but to the Piaroa, it's a source of food. The Amerindians occasionally collect their eggs, limiting the harvest to one from each nest, but they seldom hunt the adults. They call them stink birds because they smell musty. Instead, they concentrate their main efforts on more palatable prey. The Piaroa know and understand the balance between the forest's dangers and its gifts. They hunt coatis, but this South American relative of the raccoon has sharp senses and is difficult to catch.
The coati uses its long, sensitive snout to root for fruit, insects, reptiles, amphibians, and spiders. This animal is a youngster and has never encountered a giant tarantula before. It's in for an unpleasant surprise. The spider rears up to look as intimidating as possible. If this doesn't work, it will bring spines on its rear legs and specialized hairs on its abdomen into action, a remarkable defense mechanism which stops most enemies in their tracks. The spider hisses like a snake as further warning, but the coati is not deterred. Each tarantula has over a million abdominal hairs which are tipped with barbs. A single stroke with a back leg releases thousands of hairs into the air. When inhaled, they cause a fierce, burning sensation. The pain will ease after several hours, but it's a lesson learned. This young coati will grow up with a healthy fear of giant tarantulas. It will probably never attack one again. The giant tarantula has a formidable array of defenses, but it is a mild-natured creature which will only attack if it feels threatened. It's not easy to see a spider in the undergrowth, even when it's this large, but with a shaman as company, the men feel safe to hunt in the forest. They must watch their step. Danger also lurks in the waterways, in the undergrowth, and in the trees above. This bird-eating spider poses no great threat, except to an insect. It's not after the damselfly. Something much more alarming has disturbed it. Venomous snakes are a real danger. An emerald tree boa is harmless. It doesn't eat tarantulas, but the spider is not prepared to take any risks. Landing in midstream is no problem for that tarantula. It can walk on water. Its numerous hairs act as floats, and its legs make effective paddles. The Piaroa avoid all the spiders around them, except for the most dangerous one. It may seem foolhardy, but they actually regard the giant tarantula as one of the greatest gifts the forest provides. As children, they learn exactly where to find spiders and how to entice them from their lairs. They know that tarantulas respond to vibrations, and they are experts at imitating the jerky movements of a struggling insect with a piece of vine. But the spider isn't easily fooled. If it feels threatened, it'll respond with a shower of hairs. It's enough to make the hunter back off, but only temporarily. When he has lured the spider some distance from its burrow, the hunter pins it to the ground with two fingers and then cautiously gathers up all eight legs. 
He is careful not to touch the hairs on the spider's abdomen and to keep his fingers well out of range of those needle-sharp fangs. Giant tarantulas are carried live in a string of neat little parcels. A leaf serves as wrapping paper and a vine stem as string. Before he ties up the spider, he gently blows away any loose, irritating hairs. The hunting party stops for lunch at an ancient burial ground. For countless generations, it's been regarded as a special place where the spirits of the dead will watch over the living. Like their ancestors before them, the Pieroa still make fire the hard way. The rock art is believed to be over 3,000 years old. There's evidence of spidery shapes, but the symbolism of many of the drawings remains a mystery. It takes about five minutes of strenuous labor to generate the first glow of fire. Entombed in the rock, the bones of ancestors and recently departed relatives lie side by side, laid to rest in a horizontal crevice at the base of the cliff. The spirits have been kind and the hunting good. The men prepare to feast on a favorite food, spiders. They regard them as a delicacy, but take no more than they need. A couple of tarantulas each will sustain them until they return to the village. The Pieroa kill tarantulas just before they cook them to keep them as fresh as possible. That's why they tie them up into little parcels and carry them alive. They are potentially fatal until they are dead, so they're handled with extreme caution. Only when there's no sign of life will the Indians hold them. And even then, they won't touch the abdomen. They can no longer bite, but their hairs are still dangerous. Females heavy with eggs are a special treat. Each one yields about 70 to 80 eggs. When roasted over the coals, they'll make a bitter tasting omelet. The hunters toast the spider's legs on the fire, singeing off the hairs over the flames.
Patting gets rid of any remaining charred hairs. They regard the thorax and legs as the best bits. Apparently, they taste like shrimp. To the Piaroa, spiders, eggs, and meat are the equivalent of caviar and shellfish to us. The spiders are a gift from the gods. When we fail to catch other food, we can usually find spiders. We know they are dangerous, but as long as we respect their spirits, we will not get bitten. They are good food, and they are delicious. At the end of the meal, all that's left are the fangs, and even they aren't wasted. They must be the world's strangest toothpick. For the thousands of spiders which escape the hunters, the danger isn't over yet. Even more amazing than the way the Pieroa deal with them is the way spiders deal with each other. The biggest threat a male giant tarantula has to face is the female of the species. His main purpose in life is to find receptive females and fertilize them. He can detect a female in her burrow with special hairs on his legs, which are sensitive both to chemical signals and to vibrations. The male approaches the female's burrow with extreme caution. Tarantulas are not immune to their own poison, and a wrong move at any time in the courtship could prove fatal. He gently taps the female, testing for her reaction. The trick seems to be to stroke her into a trance. Next, he will gently lift her up in order to reach the sexual organs on the underside of her body. It's a procedure that cannot be hurried. He is in an extremely vulnerable position. This one made a move too soon and was lucky to survive his mistake. The male's objective is to transfer sperm carried in small brown silken sacks to the female without being eaten. up to mating can take up to two hours, but if the female isn't in the right mood, she may kill and eat her suitor. If he can maneuver the female into a suitable position, he can feel for her reproductive opening. Then he releases his sperm, first from one palp, then the other. Once he has fertilized her, he must gently put her down and then make a rapid exit before she regains her senses and tries to attack him.
Males reach sexual maturity at about three years old and die soon afterwards, but females can live for 20 years. Like the spider, there are undoubtedly many more creatures for explorers to find, but their discovery can be the first step to extinction. Already, collectors from the West are paying big prices for the latest bizarre pet, a giant tarantula. The Piaroa have never been a threat. They limit their harvest, making sure they do not harm the spider population. When I take Yopo, I see evil powers trying to steal the spiders from us. I pray to the spirits to drive these demons away. One day soon, I must teach the children of the village to take Yopo, so that when I die, at least one will take over from me and take care of the tarantulas. I speak to the spirits of the spider and ask them to make the tarantulas fertile so that they will multiply and provide food for us. Each female produces between 70 to 80 large eggs, which she wraps with silk into a ball the size of a lemon. About 80 days after they were laid, the spiderlings hatch inside the egg case. It will take them another 24 hours or so to dissolve the silk in order to break out of their cocoon. For a few days after emerging, they stay in their mother's burrow, living off the last of their fat reserves. The female's responsibility is now over. Her burrow offers the babies some security, but she does not provide them with food. Hunger will eventually force them to take their first steps into the forest alone. Surrounded by a natural world containing such fearsome creatures, the Piaroa have evolved a religion which aims to protect both themselves and the animals with which they share the forest. In a rare example of practical conservation without outside interference, the spiritual links between the Piaroa and the giant tarantula can ensure their mutual survival in the lost world.